Hang on. Come on. Hello and welcome to the first lecture for Bio 342, uh, Plagues, the New Plagues. Uh, so we're going to talk about ancient plagues all the way up to recent plagues. And a good place to start learning about plagues is we'll need to learn a little bit about the early history of medicine. And then we'll need to learn a little bit about uh, different types of cells and infectious uh, types of cells, which are, you know, bacteria, viruses, all of that. So we'll cover a little bit of that first. And then we'll get started into different types of plagues. So for now, we'll talk a little bit about the really early medicine. So this is, uh, we're going to start with the early Egyptians because that's the dawn of modern medical care, believe it or not, in about 3,000, 3,300 BCE, which is um, before the Common Era. And you might know that the Egyptians mummified their dead, which gave them a unique opportunity uh, because dissection and all of that was not forbidden, whereas it was by the Christian church and other cultures. So the first mention of a physician in the history of the world was in 3533 BC. And that's where the chief physician of a pharaoh, Pharaoh Sahura, um, cleared a disease in his nostrils or cured a disease in his nostrils. We have no idea what that is. It could be a sinus infection, it could be a boil, you know, or just some kind of lesion, or, you know, we have no idea, but it did happen. So that's kind of cool. And then we've also seen carvings in hieroglyphics and pictures on tombs. And those are the earliest pictures of surgical operations. And those were um, uh, created about 2,500 BCE. So golly, 4,500 years ago and, or more. Pretty amazing, isn't it? All right, so because of their mummification, the Egyptians knew anatomy, they knew the function of the heart, they knew we had two different veins, which we now call arteries and veins, or two different types of blood vessels, excuse me. We now call them arteries and veins. They understood the diseases of bones, GI, elementary or GI system, respiratory, circulatory, genital, genital, muscular, nervous system, ocular, auditory, ocular, auditory, and olfactory. Um, so they were all different diseases were all described in, in pretty good detail once we've learned to translate hieroglyphics um, and their surgeons used instruments very similar to what we are using today. So scalpels, forceps, scissors, that kind of thing. And they also sutured wounds. And these are recorded. We don't have visual evidence of this, but we do have recorded um, or written, so to speak, evidence that they sutured wounds and they were able to stop bleeding using cautery, which is, you know, using a uh, hot metal or fire of some sort to uh, kind of close a vein and capillary and keep it from, from bleeding. They also treated dislocated shoulders and probably other bones in very much the same way as we do today. They uh, created something of a cast for bones. Uh, they put reeds uh, like along the leg or along the arm, and then they would tie it with um, a, like a, a fibrous uh, reed or plant material. And uh, then they would soak it, uh, have a like a plaster made out of a different material than plaster. But when it when it dried, it hardened. So then the arm or the leg was secure and the bone was allowed to heal. So pretty remarkable that this was 5,000 years ago. They also had a lot of different remedies. Um, you know, typically they would use herbs and minerals. They'd mix them together. And, you know, we don't really know if they worked or not because we don't have a lot of history on, on you know, that. Uh, but they, we do know that they administered them in a variety of different ways, just like doctors do today. And they also um, were interested in psychology. Uh, and so one, one writing suggested that uh, a patient uh, write a letter to their dead relatives um, to explain what their troubles were. So, um, you know, they did believe in the dead um, uh, living on, so to speak. So this was, you know, to help them, you know, learn from their own writing, but theoretically from their their previous ancestor. So interesting. 
Uh, Herodotus, he was the father of history, uh, and he was around about 450. He was a Greek, and he wrote about the Egyptians. The practice of medicine is so divided among them that each physician is a healer of one disease and no more. So just like today, Egyptians had specialties, things that they were uh, well-versed in. And obviously this allowed them to learn more about their specific, specific area of specialty rather than just a general practitioner. So another commonality with today. Then we're gonna move on to Hippocrates of Kos. He was uh, a Greek scholar, uh, philosopher, and um, physician, I guess we can say. Uh, he was about 460 to 377 BCE, and he's known as the father of clinical medicine. And his contribution to clinical medicine and medicine in general was huge. I mean, some of his principles are still in use today, such as he recommended that physicians observe clinical signs and symptoms and reach rational conclusions and not rely on the gods, you know, Apollo or Hercules or Zeus to um, cure or create diseases. He just said, look at the patient, see what's going on and go from there. He, the one thing he did get wrong, which was followed for golly, about 2000 years, <laughs> he theorized that the body consisted of four fluids or humors. And these consisted of black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. And if one of these was out of balance, either too high or too low, then that was what was causing disease. So obviously that wasn't correct, but you know, it's good in theory. I mean, they had no medical knowledge. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta start a theory and go from there. Uh, and so the physician's role in this case was to uh, rebalance the humors. And there were many ways that they did that, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, he also, speaking of current current uh, thinking, he thought that there should be a healthy mind and a healthy body. So he promoted health, preventative health, in other words, uh, so physical activity and good nutrition. He also obviously thought that there should be intervention with trauma care, not just let the patient, patient lie there and try and heal on their own. So he developed several surgical practices um, based on injuries he saw in many of the Greek wars, uh, you know, lost patients, saved patients, um, et cetera. But he, by clinical observation and, and work, he was able to develop some practices that were, that were good. Uh, and then he also believed too, like the Egyptians in mental care or healthy mind. And his suggestion was um, music and art to help people out of like a depression or to improve, um, uh, you know, like a troubled, uh, angry uh, soul or something like that. So interesting that, you know, that would, mental health was just as important as physical health. He also uh, required of his own physicians or his students and recommended to other physicians that they used, they, they write down or they use detailed document documentation and they evaluate the patients and record that. So then they could refer back to it or another physician could refer to it and say, hey, mine looks just like that. And so, you know, advancing the practice of medicine. And so, as I've mentioned, the Hippocratic philosophy focused on holistic health and um, some of the standards and the rules that he developed for physicians of his time are still valid today. And if you know anyone who is going to medical school or who has gone to medical school, uh, once they reach, uh, once medical students finish their four years, they, at their commencement or their graduation, <laughs> they, they, they now call it the, the oath ceremony or the Hippocratic oath ceremony, because what they do is they recite the Hippocratic oath, uh, which has its basis in the writings of Hippocrates. Uh, it contains, let me just back up. There's, there's several versions of this. So different schools, you know, modify it or at different times, they modify it based on, you know, current healthcare practice and policies. But in general, it always includes um, justice and the right for pri right of privacy of patients and then respect for teachers and being, you know, in solidarity with their peers and helping their peers, all of that. Um, and the clinical and ethical basis of all medical practice, as well as many or most clinical terms, have their origins in Hippocrates. So another interesting phenomenon, you know, 
2,500 years ago, and we're still using it today. We have had some great scholars and uh, great people walk the earth before us. <laughs> Another one is Galen, and he was around 1,300 to 200. Uh, that was his lifespan, uh, AD. So he was uh, 500 years after Hippocrates. He still believed in many of the teachings of Hippocrates. He was a Greek who actually worked uh, as a Roman doctor. So he worked in the Roman Empire. Uh, he was a very skilled surgeon and he dissected animals, uh, not humans. He, that was not allowed, but he dissected animals and learned a lot about, uh, you know, circulatory system, the nervous system, and those kind of things. Of course, they weren't completely accurate because he was dealing with other animals rather than humans, but they were, they were remarkably um, similar in many respects. He was also a... Um, a physician for the gladiators in Rome or in Roman towns. And he learned a lot from their injuries. He was their surgeon or their physician. Uh, so he learned a lot from their injuries, but also he became very good at treating their injuries, tra trauma injuries. And um, the, the previous physician, and I don't know how long either of them was in practice at the gladiator Colosseum, but the previous one lost over 60 gladiators where Galen only lost five. So I think that's a pretty good statistic on him. Um, he wrote a, a, a psychological um, uh, treatise or, or book called On the Diagnosis and Cure of the Soul's Passion. And so again, psychology was important to Galen as a physician and um, uh, continued that throughout uh, history and um, some of our, his ideas we have um, followed as well. All right, so now let's move into medieval medicine. Uh, that a good time. Uh, so medieval medicine or the Middle Ages was the period of time right after the fall of the Roman Empire, which was around the fifth century to the Renaissance, which was about the 15th century. So when the Roman Empire collapsed, all of the European countries had kind of feuding tribes or, you know, sex, if you will. And they they were all fighting. And eventually uh, a new system kind of developed, which was called feudalism. And most of these countries were primarily rural or areas. And so they had a very simple social structure, um, which was uh, king at the top, then the nobles, then the knights, then the peasants. So, you know, it was just kind of a really straight line triangular system. Also the Christian church survived the fall of the Roman empire, as we know, uh, and it became a very big influence on medicine and all things cultural. Um, and you know, the, the middle ages, we did not see any dissection. We saw very little medicine because uh, the church promoted healing based on God's will. So medicine was kind of at a standstill during the middle ages. Uh, here is the um, uh, the system, uh, feudal system. You can see here on the top, the church and the king. At some points, the, the church had primary authority and other times the king had primary authority. Then the next level is nobles. And then also at this time, um, town merchants and craftsmen were beginning to become more like um, middle income or higher middle income, if you will, uh, because they owned shops, they made the you know, good money, and they were a little bit uh, wealthier than many of the people of the land. So they kind of rose in um, in their social strata. Uh, underneath the nobles were the lords. And so the lords are people who were landowners, uh, and they would have knights who served under them and serfs or peasants who served under them. The knights, when the king called for knights to serve in a war, the lords would send you know, a certain percentage or number of their knights. And then the serfs did all the work of the land for the Lord. In exchange, they essentially got a shack to live in and a little bit of food, um, but all the proceeds of the, the property and their work went to uh, the Lord. There were a few um, peasants called freemen, and that meant that you did not owe anybody anything. The serfs were basically owned by the Lords and they owed them the serfs or the serfs owed the lords money based on what they had been given, like their own land or their own house. And so they had to continue to work for them. 
Uh, here's just another little diagram of the medieval hierarchy, uh, it's a little more simplified and colorful. Uh, up the top, we have the king, and down below, we have the church officials and the nobles kind of on the same plane. And then under them are the knights, and finally down below, the peasants, which are the ones doing all the work. <laughs> All right, so as the Middle Ages continued, trade expanded and towns became uh, more predominant and much larger as people were moving to the city. There were more tri tradespeople and craftspeople, which were becoming the middle class. And now you know where that comes from. And it still is that, you know, the people who, quote, do a good majority of the work but earn money for it, those are kind of the middle class. Um, the wealthy people are the ones who own land or property or lots of businesses or whatever. And then, you know, we have, we have the lower class, which is uh, people who are kind of stuck, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, there's a, of course, as you know, big movement to kind of help even out stuff, but we'll see where that goes. Um, the towns were much more crowded, as I mentioned, and the streets were very dirty and very noisy. People had like these, there were like windows, but not a window, just like a, a hole. And that was where they threw their waste out, you know, all their food waste and, you know, clippings and fat that they cut cut off animals and then of course all their human waste so urine and feces and you know anything else all just went out the window and typically there was a sewer either right down the middle of the street we call it a sewer but it's basically a pit I mean a, a, a river like pit or a canal and or it might be on both sides of the street and it all of the all of the yuck from all of the houses and businesses in the town just kind of flowed away sort of um there was also at this time, some of the tradespeople, they would butcher animals in the street or they would sell vegetables. And so, and then animals roamed freely. So it was really kind of a yucky place, especially to walk around it. But, um, oh, another thing uh, about this era was that there was really a great deal of crime. And you've probably seen this in some of the old movies you've seen that, you know, there was a lot of theft along roads and, you know, murders and all of that. And, you know, it was a bit, pretty much just because very crowded and a lot of people had nothing. So on the next image, we can see um, an artist's painting of a medieval village. And here you can see people standing around. There looks like there's a tradesperson, uh, trade shop over on the right. There's a knight riding his horse down the middle of the street. The streets are moist and wet, so they're probably filled with, you know, waste or old water, dishwater, or old beer, or whatever. Uh, you can also see a pig and some chickens there that are just kind of hanging around. So you can also notice that the street is very narrow and uh, the, the buildings are very, very close together. So they did that purposefully. Um, you know, the buildings, if they were close together, provided warmth and, um, you know, they could reuse some of the materials from the, the structure next door. And so anyway, that was, that was the way they did it, but not probably not the best place to walk around. And also the smell was very bad, of course. So we had the four humors. And so that was one theory, but a theory that came up at this time was also a theory called miasma. And I'm sorry, I've misspelled that there. It should be M-I-A-S-M-A. -S Got my A out in the wrong place. But that was basically dirty air. Now, if you're living in a, a town that's kind of compact and you have all of this garbage and waste and sewage in the middle of your street, it's going to smell bad. So when you get sick, you know, you're going to think that smell is what's causing me to be sick. And in a way, it's true. It was more the organisms and stuff that were in the waste rather than the smell itself. But, you know, if you didn't know anything about that, you would certainly think that this bad air is making me sick. So that was my asthma. The other thing, uh, two other theories at the time were God, of course, and I mentioned that, you know, the church really pushed for that, that diseases were punishment from God for your sins, or if you weren't sinful, then perhaps they were testing your faith. Uh, then there was also the supernatural theories, which are witchcraft and then astrology, that kind of thing. Uh, and believe it or not, in the 14th century, astrology was part of medical training. Physicians truly believe that the stars and the planets affected health. So, yep, that's what they that's what they believed in. All right, so we also need to talk a little bit about the treatments because that impacted how people survived and didn't survive. So for the four humors, you know, things were out of balance. And so what they wanted to do was restore the balance. You know, if it was like this and they wanted to restore it. Anyway, so what they did was they tried to get rid of the bad humors that were in your body. So one method was bloodletting. 
And that was the most common way. You know, you slice open a vein or just a just the skin and you let the, the blood drain out. Well, didn't really have a good effect on people because, you know, that just creates anemia or, you know, blood pressure issues, lots of other problems, infection, et cetera. And then cupping was similar to that. You made a cut and then the cup, the warmed cup was on and it pulled blood out. Leaching, that's adding leeches to suck out the bad blood. Purging where you drank things that would make you vomit. Um, and then you would vomit out the, the bad humors. Laxatives, would remove it the other way. And then bathing, which would be, <laughs> you know, probably probably the most effective because none of them, none of the other ones were effective. They actually were more harmful. Um, but anyway, taking a bath in warm herbs to draw out the, the bad humors. And if you believed that religion was the cause of disease, then you would uh, do prayers and incantations. You might pay for a mass to be said to help you to recover. Uh, you might fast, going without food to, you know, uh, have some penance for your sins. Um, or to prove that you know you were still faithful, and then occasionally there were pilgrimages to tombs to you know like you would go there and you pray to the saint or you would touch the relics you know the bones or the cups or you know whatever it was of the particular saint and that would give you like a better end to that saint and um, hopefully they could they could heal you. All right, so some of the herbal remedies um, they used, you know, you would either, as I mentioned, you could bathe them, them. you could also drink them or sniff them, uh, you know, just uh, inhaling a, you know, a little bit of oregano or whatever. Most of them didn't hurt and most of them didn't help. Um, but a couple that did help, um, honey, they put honey on wounds to fight infection. And in fact, honey is bactericidal, meaning that it helps to kill and prevent bacteria. So that was good. And aloe vera for digestion, that helped a little bit. And then herbs, minerals, and animal parts, as I mentioned, lots of lots of other things. I don't know if you're a, if you ever watch Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, my daughter loved that. So you guys might be too young. But anyway, um, Dr. Quinn used to brew willow bark tea for her patients. And actually, willow bark is uh, a source of aspirin. So it it worked. It worked in bringing down fever and it worked in bringing yeah, and in relieving some pain. So a lot of these remedies, I mean, you got to think uh, humans have been on the earth for 5,000, 10,000 years at this time. So some of the things they, they figured out are actually real and they actually work. So good for them. Uh, a lot of them didn't, but that's okay. And if you believed in the supernatural causes of, um, of illness, then you would have kind of a specific treatment. So uh, your healer might suggest you wear a magpie's beak around your neck for a toothache, toothache, or you might carry a bag of something else, or you know, other herbs or something around you to, you know, heal you or whatever. Then there were barber surgeons, and these were, I want to say, barbaric surgeons. <laughs> they were untrained, but one thing that they did in the Middle Ages was they trepanned skulls, which means putting a drill or a nail or something in the head. And um, that would supposedly let the demons come out and, you know, flow away. So ugh. <laughs> glad I don't live in. All right. So who were the healers? Um, the first category is wise women. And those were mostly uh, women who uh, did some charms or spells and had some herbal remedies. Uh, they were very cheap, of course, and they also assisted in childbirth and midwifery. Um, but this is actually where, you know, kind of the, the witch comes from, the, 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 you know, the historical witch, if you will, because these persons would do charms and spells and um, they, they, you know, in the Middle Ages, they weren't thought of as witches, they were thought of as healers, but Anyway, uh, and then there were physicians and physicians were medically trained at university for five to seven years. Hippocrates and Galen were also some of those who were trained in this category, uh, but they didn't do dissection. So they didn't know very much anatomy. And they also got most of their knowledge from talking with other physicians or hearing lectures. They didn't get a lot of knowledge from going to see patients. So they would just show up when a patient was sick and say, you have this take this, you know, they wouldn't necessarily do much examination. And there weren't very many of them. So, you know, people relied on wise women and then we'll talk about another couple of types of healers, but physicians were very expensive. Uh, and then what they did is they'd go in and they'd, 
give you a diagnosis, but then they would suggest you see an apothecary or a barber surgeon to um, actually carry out the treatment that they recommended because they were cheaper. So apothecaries were trained, but they didn't really have any medical qualifications. They uh, were very experienced. They usually started at a young age and followed someone and they became more, became better at what they, um, what they could learn and dispense and all of that. They mixed a lot of different ingredients and they did understand some of the healing powers of different herbs, you know, like I just mentioned, boulevard tea and honey. Uh, and they were much cheaper than a physician. So like I said, the, the, the doctor would come in and said, you have this, go to the apothecary and get these herbs. And then the apothecary would mix it up and hopefully the patient would get some healing or at least some relief. And then there were the barber surgeons and these were untrained uh, people. They use no anesthesia and no antiseptic. So, you know, you felt everything and you could get a bad infection from it. They were cheapest, but they had very, very low success rates in surgeries, obviously. Uh, their primary uh, success, if you will, would be pulling teeth, letting blood, you know, blood letting, lancing boils. They removed arrowheads because of all the wars. They could remove tumors and they could also amputate limbs. Um, but that wouldn't be one I'd like to have done. <laughs> anyway, um, so hospitals in medieval times. The very first hospital in England was uh, created and set up in 1123. It was called St. Bartholomew's in London and it's still there today, believe it or not. London is a very old city. Um, the first hospitals were were actually set up in churches, St. Bartholomew's, and the monks cared for primarily older people or people who were so injured that they really couldn't care for themselves. And they provided care, but no cures. They weren't like physicians trying to cure disease. They were there to provide food, comfort, say mass, uh, you know, pray for you. They did not allow infectious diseases of any kind. So it was, like I said, mostly just caring for people who were disabled or old. They did keep things very clean, which was <clears throat> less common uh, in most of the uh, healing areas and healing practices there. They had gardens, herbs, vegetable patches. And so, in, in, you know, no doubt they used some of those herbs to try and alleviate some of the sufferings of their, um, their patients. Uh, later on, smaller hospitals were developed in more in mass by wealthy merchants. Okay, so these are the people who started the trades. The cities got larger and larger, their families, their friends needed care. And so they actually started to set up hospitals to care for sick people. And by 1400 AD, there were over 500 hospitals in London. So quite, quite a big number by that time. All right, so now we'll just move quickly into Renaissance medicine. Uh, the Renaissance was in 1550 to about 1750. And that Renaissance means rebirth. And it refers to a period in European history that um, was a rebirth of all kinds of thinking. So the Middle Ages was, we also call it the Dark Ages. Uh, everything kind of stayed the same. Uh, superstition, God, all of that kind of rule. There was not a lot of big thought in art or in religion or political or scientific. So those all came uh, to, to the forefront during the Renaissance. So as far as medicine in the Renaissance, very fewer people believed in either God as a cause of disease or supernatural superstition causes of disease. They did still be believe in miasma, there I have it spelled right, thank you, uh, which was the bad smells and the evil fumes causing disease. Herbal remedies were still very popular and there was a new idea called transference. And this is kind of odd, but in this case, I've, I've given you an example um, where if you rub something or you put something on a patient, then that the disease is transferred to either that inanimate object or that uh, paste or whatever it is they used. Um, it didn't work, you know that, <laughs> but hey, they tried. And despite huge improvements in anatomical knowledge, many physicians and other healers still diagnosed using the old ideas. Uh, wasn't quite, um, there was not enough belief in, in these new ideas that they would actually, actually use them. Um, the four humors was still thought to be the primary cause of disease, so they continued using bleeding and purging. The scientific revolution uh, occurred in the Renaissance, in Renaissance, during the Renaissance. And, you know, that was, you know, the same thing as 
the art renaissance and you know all kinds of other things but it started in the 16th century and it was an age of logic reasoning experimentations uh, and had a significant impact on medical thinking uh, along this time was also uh, i believe galileo and you know a number of other great thinkers whether it would be medicine or other types of science uh, so a great deal more logic. And in England, the Royal Society was founded at Gresham College, 1660. And the good thing about this place was they invited people in and they could have their own labs and do their own research. And the printing press had been uh, developed or discovered or made, whatever you want to call it. And so all of these uh, scientists at that time had knowledge of books and could look at other publications from different people, different countries, uh, many different places. So they were, uh, it was much easier to share ideas about medicine, which was a real boon for medicine because, you know, if you only know what one person has told you about medicine, then that's what you believe. But if you read, you know, 10 or 15 or 30 different authors, then you might start to form your own opinions. And so that really did help to advance uh, medical knowledge. Um, so they also encourage debate and, you know, uh, repeating experiments there to prove them or disprove them. So it was uh, the Royal Society is it's still in still in um, uh, in place today. And uh, anyway, it's a good place. So here is Thomas Sydenham. I have lots of heroes throughout my lectures here because these guys did great things. And obviously, you can tell that Hippocrates was was one of them. But Thomas Sydenham was the English. Hippocrates. He was considered the father of English medicine. And in 1676, he released Observations Medicae, which was a book in Latin, which was used for over 200 years in medical training. So that's to like mid 1800s, 1870s, almost to the 1900s. So he had a huge impact, obviously. His key ideas were doctors must rely on their own observations and practical experiences rather than just reading books. I mean, that seems so obvious to us, but at the time, you know, it wasn't so obvious. They thought that um, doctors should actually visit the sick. They should take their pulse. They should make notes about their patient and their symptoms. Um, and that would help them to find the correct diagnosis. He also thought there were species of diseases, and we do classify them now in different, you know, categories, viruses, bacteria, etc. But the species of diseases would make it, if they were classified, they would make it easier to treat them because this disease might be similar to this disease, to this disease, to this disease, and like, okay, we'll treat them all the same like this, but then this disease and this disease are different. We'll treat them in a different way. So, those were a couple of his key ideas. He also said that the four humors were completely wrong. That, that was BS. And he also said that God did not cause disease. This was not believed by everyone in the Renaissance, but it was by Thomas Sydenham. Uh, later on, he found that quinine was effective in treating malaria, which is quinine is still used today. And then iron, uh, he suggested be used to treat anemia, and that is still used today. But bad thing was he still believed that disease was caused by atmospheres or miasma. You know, they're all good. They're just not perfect. That's okay. All right, so what are the types of healers during the, the Renaissance? The same group as we saw in the Middle Ages. So it was, you know, healers, apothecaries, surgeons, physicians, you know, women. So physicians were still educated at the university, but they did start to study anatomy. So that was good. They also had a lar much larger selection of books, but actual training hands-on, that was very rare. So apothecaries and surgeons were still around. They'd had no uh, university training. They were inferior to doctors. <clears throat> they were still the cheaper alternative, but they did begin to organize into guild systems, which is something like a union, if you will, um, where they had to have like a license. They had to prove their knowledge or, you know, do a certain um, um, task, you know, create something to a certain level uh, before they could be um, licensed. And um, so apothecaries and surgeons uh, were licensed um, at this time after so much experience. So, um, you know, that that helped the profession of apothecaries and surgeons a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, their practical experience grew a lot because there were lots of wars during the Renaissance time and late Renaissance. Uh, 
So as far as hospitals during the Renaissance, most sick people were still cared for at home by women. Um, physicians were too expensive. And so there was very little change in hospitals uh, during the Renaissance from the Middle Ages. And there was definitely no increase in public sanitation um, during the Middle Ages, or during the Renaissance. So another one of my great guys is Robert Hooke. This is interesting. This picture, this is the only picture of him known to exist. And there's, he was a, he was a um, kind of a rival with Galileo. And some people believe that Galileo stole this picture uh, and it was hidden for a long time. It recently was sold, not recently, in the 1960s, it was sold to a collector uh, in, at auction and nobody knows who bought it. Nobody knows where it is. So who knows? But anyway, Robert Hooke was great. He was the guy who had to thought up and had the first compound microscope made for him. Remember, that's an ocular lens and an objective lens. And so those two magnifications create the possibility to see tiny things. So great contribution. He wrote the Micrographia, which is one of the first detailed books on microscopy and imaging. And he was also the first person to name and describe a cell. So huge contribution. Um, this is his microscope and you can see on the upper part, there's an eyepiece and that has the ocular lens and there's the barrel, which is just a distance between two lenses. And then down at the very bottom, almost a hypodermic looking is another uh, lens called the objective. It's a very small lens, obviously. Uh, and then the specimen holder was like a pin or something and he could put a drop of water, or, uh, a plant cell or a piece of skin or something on that. And he could, he could see what, um, you know, what it looked like very mag magnified view. Uh, the oil is there to uh, that burns and creates light. The water flask there increases um, the light. So he could use that to, um, you know, see better, see his specimens better. So it was the very first compound microscope. This was about 1670. And these are um, two images, remarkable. So on the left-hand side was a body louse, and that was drawn by Robert Hooke in his uh, book, Micrographia. And on the right is a body louse from a microscope that we would have in use today. So you can see his microscope was actually pretty darn good for somebody 400 years ago. Amazing. And I've always liked this guy. I don't know why. Antony, Antony van Leeuwenhoek was Dutch and he created a very unique microscope about the same time as uh, Robert Hooke. He didn't use a compound microscope, but he and his brothers were glass makers, glasses makers. And so they were able to grind glass and make it, you know, make magnification really well. Um, and so he made in 18, 1675, this, this simple microscope. And basically there's a sample holder and there's a little dot right above the sample holder, which is just, that's where his lens is. And then he has a little focus knob, which, you know, makes the specimen go in or out just a tiny bit and you'd hold this up and you can look through that little lens and you can then see um, the, the magnified specimen and he often made a new microscope for each specimen so he might have 20 or 30 of these laid out one would have a plant one would have something you know etc and um, then when he would invite people over you know other scientists or maybe his family, I don't know who, uh, but he would he would let them look through all these microscopes and see his, his different um, microscopic views of different organisms and different things. So kind of cool. Um, and here is on the left, his you know copy of his, or actually this may be the real microscope. Um, and then you can see a magnification, which was taken uh, from a camera looking into that. It's not, you can't see like what the human eye can see, but then on the right is his sketches of diatoms, uh, which he saw in using his microscope. So he was also the first to view bacteria and protozoa, both of which move. So when he examined some pond water, he saw these moving organisms and he called them animacules because the only thing that moved in his day were humans, animals, etc. So he called them animacules. They were actually protozoas, but still very cool. Love that guy. <laughs> All right. So the next uh, lecture will be the industrial era. Uh, and that's from approximately 1700. It gets us up close to today. Um, and that will be the next lecture. All right. Thanks for listening.